Hello, I am Dr. Kathleen Hall, and this is The Way I See It. Today's podcast is, I asked the president for help, and he said yes. Today, I'd like to talk about what a true key, what I have found throughout my long life, what one of the true keys to health and happiness and success is, but is, but most of us fear it. And it's asking for what you want or need, asking for help. Because most of us are afraid to ask for help. So what I want to begin with is why it's so hard for us humans to ask for help and share my own personal story next and then give some tips on um, maybe why you're not asking for help and how you can. So how I'd like to start is with my own frustration and my own inability for a huge part of my life to not be able to ask for help. I grew up in a uh, Roman Catholic family. My mother was a was a big time Catholic, and my father was uh, nothing. He was um, absolutely not religious at all. But what I remember is growing up hearing this quote that my mother would say: "Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened." And here's the real kicker. For everyone who asks, receives. Mm -hmm. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So, I heard this most of my childhood years, but it never seemed to help me. I tried to believe it, but I continued to ask, why am I, why do I keep praying and asking for help, asking for intervention in this horrendous family? And again, my father was, for those of you who have never heard a podcast of mine, my father was violent uh, and uh, just a really, really dark person. My mother was uh, very religious, Roman Catholic. So she um, herded us all up all the time, seven children, and had us get on our knees quite frequently during the day to pray for my father's father to change, to change him from, you know, buying more guns or knives or, or killing our animals or all the lovely things that he did in front of us and to us. So she would do this Sermon on the Mount saying that Jesus said, Matthew 7, 7, again, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you'll find, knock, the door will be opened. And this happens for everybody. So when I was a child, and as I grew up, I kept thinking, well, how can that be true? How can that be true? Because I keep praying, I keep asking, I keep doing all this fasting and praying and being a good girl and blah, blah, blah. I go to confession every Friday, go to communion on Sunday. I mean, it was an exhausting life of trying to be better and good and asking and begging and knocking on that door. But it didn't happen for me. It just seemed to mire into getting worse and worse. But I'll tell you later in the podcast that it finally did work and how it worked. But why do some people find it so hard to ask for help? We all go through tough times. We all know that. That's part of life. It's, you know, uh, suffering, being alive. And many of us find it hard to ask for help. The root causes of our fear to ask for help varies, of course, from different people generally. But without asking for help, remember this, you get stuck. You can't move forward. It's almost like being in quicksand. And, and the, when you move and you try to do it by yourself, you get deeper and you get sucked in deeper. And you have less choices the more you uh, get sucked in deeper. Um, so some people have a hard time asking for help because it can show weakness or other people don't have the social skills. For me, it was surely a sign of weakness. So consequently, we end up facing our own problems alone. And here again, once we are afraid to ask and we continue failing, there are all of these horrible things that we draw in, shame, anger, self-loathing, all of these things, and then we almost prefer to fail because we become a victim, and we live in victimology. And I can say this for a fact. This is what my mother did. I mean, she would pray, 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 do rosaries, take us to church more and more and more every time the door was open, and incrementally, 
the, our situation in our home got worse and more violent and more horrendous. So it was almost like I would look at her from the corner of the room and go, she actually, I think she prefers this victimology and prefers to fail. So here, you know, th this is, a, I hate to say it, but it truly is a fact. But here's another truth. We don't succeed on our own. Okay, people like victims who get mired in their own shame. They, they become isolated and alone and ashamed. But remember, the truth is we can't succeed on our own. We can't get out of whatever we're in on our own. We must learn to be interdependent. Not dependent, not independent always. Interdependent. And most cultures in the world that thrive know this. They cherish their interdependence and their ability to depend on each other and ask for help. Asking for help is not a burden or a sign of weakness. It's a sign of being human. And truly, I believe asking for help is the ultimate act of courage. One of the greatest advantages we have is that we can help one another. However, some people aren't capable of asking for help. Today, we're going to talk about the root causes of the issue and what you can do not to fall into the category of being afraid of asking for help. Most people who've grown up in individualistic cultures, like the United States, where I happen to live, are often raised with the belief that relying on others and asking for help is a burden to others and makes you seem emotionally weak. I was brought up by a mother and father who were fiercely independent and revered this, not only in the country, this country we live in, is independence, radical independence revered, but also in my family. It's, you're, you're proud to say, I did it by myself, I, I did it alone. The message from my particular family was clear, you're weak if you ask for help. That was them. But what I'd like to do is tell you a story, a short little story of my own life, when I asked for help and it changed my life. I was in a horrible situation. I was probably about 19 years old. I was at Ohio State University, and I was a very poor student. I was on every scholarship, every grant. I worked in the work-study program. I did anything to make a penny. I was actually uh, partially living in my car um, because I really didn't know anybody there. Uh, the reason that I had moved up there and went to Ohio State University was because uh, my family was from Ohio. And I figured that my grandmother was an hour away. My aunt was like an hour, hour and a half away, and I would have some social support. But um, I was up there. I'll never forget this. It was winter, you know, and I know you know this, but when it snows there, it's feet of snow. And uh, it was a horrible situation. Again, at, I had two pair of pants, one coat. Uh, I ate one meal a day. Uh, and again, I was partially living in my Volkswagen uh, that didn't even have uh, a flooring to it because it was from Florida and had been rusted out. So to say it was a dire situation and getting worse by the moment, uh, and I just didn't know what to do, but I did know that I verbally couldn't ask for help. That was just something I'd never learned. You get out of it yourself. You're smart. Get out of it yourself. Work out of it. So what happened was um, I saw this guy in class, and he was very nice to me. So one day... After class, he saw me in my car getting my blankets and things, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, actually, I'm embarrassed, but, uh, and he said, I've been seeing you. He said, how often are you in this car? And I said, well, I haven't found a place to stay again, so I'm actually living in my car. And he said, my God, you can't do that. And he said, here, here, um, I live with four guys. We live on High Street. We live in an old house. Um... We all grew up together on farms. We know each other. And he said, and, but we all have the bedrooms taken up. And he said, but there's a basement where there's, um, a, a, you know, it's a coal burning stove. It has a stoker and, um, and it has, you know, there's a cot down there. Uh, so if you want, you could just stay down there and at least you'll be warm until you, until you find out what to do. And I said, well, what would I do to pay for it? And he said, well, I'll tell you the truth. You could help us cook, cook, and maybe clean the house. And he said, there is a stoker there. And for those of you who don't know what a stoker is, that when you have a coal furnace, there is like this basket or this container. It's big. It's, it's steel. And what you do is you uh, shovel the coal into the stoker and you fill it up. And then there's like a little conveyor belt that goes into the furnace. 
so that you can fill up the stoker and then it slowly keeps filling the furnace so that you can have continual heat in a house and it keeps it at a normal temperature, bringing the coal in as needed into the furnace. So anyway, I thought, well, sure, I can fill the stoker with coal. Uh, you know, the coal uh, bin and the coal pile was right there. And there was the um, little cot. And he said, we can put up a shower curtain to give you some privacy so that when we walk, come downstairs to grab stuff that, you know, you have a little privacy. So that was my life. I felt blessed to be warm. And uh, when that, when I cooked their food, I got to eat and um, there were people around and they treated me very kindly. Um, and I was coming out of such shame. Um, they helped heal me by their kindness. So anyway, um, and, and during this time, my mother would call me intermittently and she happened to live in Columbus, Georgia, which was about 10, 12 hours away. Uh, with my father and my four brothers and sisters. And my father, again, had gotten continually more violent and awful. So my mother called me to keep me apprised of the situation regularly once a week. But this week when she called, she was strange. And she scared me and she said, um, he actually has been keeping the bed under, the gun under the bed. He's more violent than ever. And I'm afraid that he might kill me. So um, I panicked and... Uh, said, you know, I've got to figure out a way to get down there. I had no money, none. And I said, I have to get gas money. I have to figure out what I can do. And I was panicked. And I was in the middle of cooking dinner for the boys. So anyway, my roommate, so I was fixing dinner. They were in the other room watching the evening news very loud. And all of a sudden, I think it was Walter Cronkite who said, and the hot news tonight is there's a new governor, a peanut farmer, from Plains, Georgia, named Jimmy Carter, and he is the new governor of the state of Georgia. And so here is his first press conference from the peanut farmer who is a religious guy, and he went on and on. So I stopped washing the dishes and cooking dinner and everything, and I went and stood at the corner of the room and listened to um, what this Governor Carter said. And... He said, um, he was like, I don't even know how to say this. He was like something out of a dream. He, he said, um, I am here to serve the poor. I am here to work for justice. I am here to serve you people. That's what I am. I am a servant leader and I will help the poorest of the poor, uh, women who need help, uh, people who can't find jobs and whatever dire situation you're in, there's hope. I promise you, I'm here to bring you hope. So um, I, I don't know what happened, but it, he totally affected me. After dinner and doing the dishes and everything, I went down and sat by the furnace and, and pulled, it was a pull light. That's the light I had down there in the basement. So I pulled the light and got a piece of notebook paper and a pen. Well, it wasn't a pen. It was a pencil, which is what I had at that time. And I thought, I'm going to write him a letter and see if he can help me. Maybe he can help me help my mom. He said he can help the poor and people that don't have hope. I, I, I have to ask somebody. I don't know what else to do. I have nothing, absolutely nothing, and I know nobody in Georgia. So I will never forget, I got the paper, and I started writing, and I said, Dear Governor Carter, I just saw you on the evening news, and I need your help. Could you help me? You said you would help those that were hopeless, t afraid, hungry. And I went through the litany of what he had said and said, um, my father, and I started out in the next paragraph and said, my father is going to kill my mother in Columbus, Georgia. And I said, please, can you help me? Um, and I went on to tell him how violent my father was and how he reveled in, you know, killing animals and hurting us and everything. And when my mother called, he was really going to do it. And I had no money and I had no way to get down there. And could he please help my mother and help me? And I told, wrote her name and her address and said, could you, you know, I, I need help. And I told him how poor I was and I was living in the basement and um, shoveling coal and doing what I could do to, to eat and da, da, da. So I told him the truth out of my shame, which I was, out of my feeling like an utter failure, out of everything. But I asked for help for the first time in my life. So I sent the letter off in two feet of snow in a blizzard. I went to the post office and mailed that letter and put a stamp on it. And it's hilarious. I sent it out on Tuesday. On Friday, 
I'm fixing dinner, and uh, it, it was like three or four, we were going to have pizza. Uh, everybody was through class on Friday early, so it was, I don't remember, it was early afternoon. Phone rings, late afternoon, excuse me. Phone rings, and um, uh, Ronnie, the roommate, says, uh, Kath, Kathleen, the phone's for you. And I said, oh, nobody called me there except my mother. So um, I picked up the phone and said, you know, hello, Kathleen Hall. And this woman said, hello, this is Governor Carter's office from Georgia. Uh, could you hold for Governor Carter, please? I couldn't believe it. I just sat there in silence. And all of a sudden, on the other side of the phone, hello? Is this Kathleen Hall? Hi, honey, how are you doing? Uh, how's the weather up there? I hear it's cold. And he just talked about regular things. And I was in a state of shock. And he said, now, here's what I want you to do. He said, number one, um, I have this grant. It's called LEAA, um, Law Enforcement Assistance um, Act. And he said, and what we're going to do is we're going to study the Columbus Police Department. We've had some problems with racism there. I have a Yale lawyer that I picked to go down there and study this thing and send me, and, and the government, federal government, wants a report back to them in Washington, D.C. And I have one more opening, and guess whose name is on that opening? That name is you. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring you down here. I'm going to give you 30 credit hours at the local Columbus College. And he said, and you're going to get, I can't remember if it was three or $400 a month. So it, there was a stipend with it that I got money. And he said, so we're going to get you down here. And uh, you're going to go to the Western Union office up there in Columbus, Ohio. And I have wired you some money, plenty of gas money. And so you can get gas and food and come on down here. And he said, and be safe. And he said, and I've already sent the police over to your mother's house just to have a little talk with your father. And he said, so I want you to get down here. And when you get down here and settled in with your mom, I said, I want you to give me a call. And he said, because we're going to change things. I promised that and I promised that. And here we are. And he said, does that sound like a good plan for you? I will never in my life. I didn't answer. He said, are you still there? And I, I I, I don't even know what to tell you what to do, what I did. So I um, said, yes, sir, and I hung up the phone, and I went down to the Western Union Station, and the money was there, and I packed my things, and I hugged the boys goodbye, and I headed to Columbus, Georgia. I got down there. Uh, there was a police officer there uh, in front of Stark Avenue where my mother lived, and uh, the house and shook my hand. Uh, there was a packet there for me, this grant that I was on. It showed me where to go at the police department. I went to the Columbus Police Department. I worked there for months and months and uh, evaluated every department to, uh, to explore it with police officers and the community relations to find out how the, the community felt about the police officers and the racism in Columbus and wrote reports and got to know people in all kinds of communities and and the police and I became besties and I felt protected and I, they went by the, my home all the time and had coffee with my mom and I. So my dad was contained. Um, I mean, it was a miracle, right? How, what were the chances of having police officers in your home, having coffee, me working with the police? What is this? What is this? I was like, did this really work, this ask, receive, knock? After all these years, maybe something miraculous happened? So um, anyway, it was um, the biggest dramatic change in my entire life that changed the whole trajectory of my life. Because after that, of course, I know you know this, with violent crimes and things, I spent a lot of time in the emergency room with victims and all kinds of other things and got to know a lot of the emergency room docs and uh, nurses and all that stuff. And... Um, Eventually, I met a skinny, beautiful medical student named Jim Hickson, and uh, that's who I have been married to for uh, well over four decades. And, um, and if I wouldn't have asked for help, if I wouldn't have had, I don't even know where I got the courage to do that, uh, but it took courage. And uh, then to come down there and create a new life uh, and marry uh, 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 the most kind, gentle man that I'd ever known in my life, uh, I, I can't even tell you. Then I continued. I went on to Columbus College. Um, so that was my story of when I asked for help. And of course, Jimmy Carter eventually became president of the United States. And the funny thing was many 
a couple decades later, let me see how many decades later, I happened to be a graduate student at Emory University, and uh, President Jimmy Carter is a professor out there. He is on the faculty, and he teaches ethics at Emory University, and guess who my professor was? Guess who I got to study with? And after the first day of class, I walked up to him and hugged him, crying like a baby, and telling him what he did for me. And he smiled and he said, I remember you. So he eventually became president of the United States. And, of course, the Carter Foundation, which has saved more lives and elections and the guinea worm and uh, health care and Habitat for Humanity, building homes for the poor, so um, this man asking for help didn't just help me. Do you, can you see how he answered all of these people, that other people that asked for help? So eventually that taught me a lot, and I needed a lot of help from my own woundedness to get help emotionally and psychologically from the damage that happened to me, which I got through many, many, many years of help. But I realized there was no shame, and I wasn't a loser, that I asked for help, and that I had to give up the big lie about being afraid to ask for help. So here are a few reasons why uh, some of us have problems asking for help. Shame, like me, many people, especially women, have a hard time asking for help because we women learn to settle with what we have and not make waves by asking for what we want because we know that the man that we're with lots of times is violent or angry or we're afraid they could leave us or we need them for financial support. And or the other thing, we may feel like we're wasting somebody's time but, and Or here's another thing that women lots of times believe, is that other people's time, especially men, men's time is more valuable than their own. Nope. Next, it can be your personality or your culture or your training as a child. You may be afraid, again, especially women, and not feel comfortable being assertive enough to, enough to ask for help or ask for what you need. Um, and then third is emotional issues, um, like me. Many of us uh, have low self-esteem issues. I had such low self-esteem issues, it was... It was really tragic. But we undervalue ourselves and we put other people's needs before us. Uh, we think that other people are more important and we're really hard on ourselves. And we feel inferior and weak. And another reason may be pride. And that was a huge reason. Uh, and this is one I struggle with today. Is one of the main reasons I find it hard to ask for help. Um, and I struggle with, you know, uh, this because, of course, family dynamics that I, I never saw act asking for help as courageous, okay? I, I, I was always thought, saw it as, as destructive behavior, but it's not. It's courageous asking for help. And previous negative experiences can be another reason that people have asked for help before and been rejected. And so they have a fear of this rejection. But here are some powerful examples, just a couple more, just a couple simple more, about asking for help. And yes was the answer. Uh, during this pandemic, about two months ago, there was a woman, a single mom of two kids, and she went on this app that we have, and it's called Next Door, and it's, these are community apps done by zip code. And so people can say, I lost my dog. You know, I need help moving furniture. Do you have a plumber? You know, we help each other out on this app. Well, one day this woman went on the app, and she said, I have, to, that was the title was, I need help. I'm begging. And so what happened was, I read it, and it was um, she couldn't do it anymore. She had lost her job. She uh, was feeding her kids one meal a day. She was ashamed to ask for help. She was trying to find another job. She was behind payments on her house, but she finally had come to the point that it, her, it was cold in the house. The children were freezing, and she had to ask for help. You know what was so amazing? When I read that, I went, oh, my God, well, of course. So um, it was interesting. She posted it, I think, at 9 a.m., and do you know by 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, she had over 100 responses. 99% of them, of course, were women. All of us. Can we babysit your kids? Can we bring groceries? Do you have Venmo? Do you need, do you, you know, bring me your power bill? Um, let's have the heat turned back. Whatever it was, and by three hours later, you wouldn't believe the number of people coming to this young mother's aid. So ask for help. I loved it. I loved it. I told her how courageous she was, and she set an example for all of us especially in this country, ask for help. And the next huge example, that was a little teeny one, but another big example is the GoFundMe. Most of us in the world have heard of the GoFundMe.com. It is a um, 
company where people can go online to ask for help. It's the most trusted online crowd fundraising platform in the universe. So if you need help for medical bills, if you need, if you've been in a car accident, you can't afford a wheelchair, whatever you need, you can go to GoFundMe and ask for help. It's absolutely amazing. People will ask for $5,000 and maybe get 100 People will ask for, uh, every time we have a natural disaster around the world, the GoFundMe page, please help us. Uh, these people don't have a home. Well, before we know it, maybe some contractor is going to build them a home. So this whole massive multi, I don't even know, multi-billion dollar maybe GoFundMe institution has come from GoFundMe. Help me. Uh, you can ask for help here. You, it's noble. It's courageous. Come here and ask for help. Ask for what you need. Be courageous today, okay? Be courageous. There are miracles, just like my miracle. That was a miracle, which happened to me. The Red Sea parted. My life changed. I'm telling you. But the miracle's not just for Kathleen. It's waiting for you right now. It's waiting for you. Ask, okay? Seek. Knock on that door. Just ask what you need for today. And remember this quote by one of my favorite heroes on planet Earth, who is not with us anymore, in body but in spirit, of course, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Courage, courage, courage. Courage to continue. How do we do that? By asking for help. So, this is the way I see it. I ask the president for help, and he did. He said yes. He did. So, what I'd like to invite you to do is, number one, go to Mindful Living Network. And remember our tagline, one people. We are one planet, one future. Please, it's our world. Let's hold our hearts and hands together, heal ourselves, heal our world through mindful living and mindfulness, kindness, reverent respect. Please share us. Share the Mindful Living Network with your family, your friends, your community. Let's do this. And I don't know if you know this. I fund this total thing by myself, okay? I, I, I've never taken a loan from anybody um, because I wanted to make sure that it was purely a, a service uh, institution, a service company here to serve the world, to help make it mindful. And I was afraid if I took a lot of money from venture capital people or other people that they would want to change the message. So I've scraped and used every penny that I have to try to keep this going. So please help me help us by sharing this Mindful Living Network with your friends, your family, community. Let's do this together. Okay, together, all of us can change the world. Also, we have a great newsletter. Please go on our website and sign up for our newsletter. Send it to friends, to family, to your community. Please, let's all help each other. By the way, I love the newsletter. It's a great newsletter. And um, contact me. I'd like to know what you want to talk about or any ideas you have for our company or for the Mindful Living Network. Contact me at info at our, O-U-R-M-L-N, Dot com or info at mindfullivingnetwork.com. Okay, and if you can't find that, just Google me. I'm in Wikipedia and everywhere, Dr. Kathleen Hall, and find your way to the Mindful Living Network. Okay, so we are in this together. Thank you for listening today. I asked the president for help, and my God, he did say yes. This is the way I see it. I am Dr. Kathleen Hall. Have a great day.